I want to bring you a message called Spiritual DNA Test. And you'll understand a little bit more about that as we get into uh, God's Word. But I'm going to read you a handful of verses from 1 John 3. I want to begin in where we left off last time, actually, and begin in verse number 3. And it says, Everyone who thus hopes in Him, speaking of Christ, purifies himself as Christ is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But this, uh, by this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. I, I have to take a little stroll down memory lane, and I'm going to just drag you along with me tonight. Um, I was a deceived church member. Most of you have heard me give my testimony. Some of you may not. I'm not going to give it all, but let me just tell you this. When I was a little boy, I asked Jesus into my heart. At Christian camp at age 14, I was baptized, and in the denomination I was uh, going to at that time, they told you when you're baptized is when you receive the Holy Spirit, and at that moment, you're truly heaven-bound. Well, here's the thing. I could have been baptized a hundred times that day, and I was still not going to be heaven-bound because I was a deceived church member. Now, I didn't know that at the time, and as a matter of fact, over the next 10 years, I had a broken heart. I was angry at God. I was angry at my family. I was just angry, and so I I lived in absolute rebellion against God because I reached a point where I no longer believed in anything. And so I took all of my inward anger and frustration and bitterness, and I just lived a life of I don't care anymore from age 14 to 24. Well, God sent a faithful witness into my life at age 22, and at age 22, this brother began to share the gospel with me. And all the while, I held my ground. I said, hey, man, I, I know I'm not as good of a Christian as you. I, I know I'm not living the right way, but I'm just backslid. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he rose again. I asked him to forgive me, and I'm going to heaven when I die. It doesn't matter that I'm living like hell right now. I'm going to heaven when I die. And this brother stuck with me for a long time, for two solid years, until finally there came a point where at least I thought, well, I probably ought to rededicate. Here's an interesting statement. This is how messed up my thinking was. On the day I fully surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, which was August 4th of 1994, I literally didn't know I needed to be judicially saved. I literally thought, I'm just surrendering to God and I'm going to get back on the right track. And so I committed my life to Jesus Christ. It was broken and ruined. And I knew immediately that my life had been changed because God took away all the desire for the things that I had been living for for 10 years. He radically transformed my heart, but it wasn't until two weeks after my conversion that I was reading the scriptures and God's spirit convicted me and showed me that I had not rededicated, that I had been born again. So I picked up the phone and I called Scott Johnson, who had witnessed to me for two years, and I said, Scott, I got to tell you something. He said, say on, Jeff. I said, man, I didn't rededicate. I got saved. And he said, I know. And it was literally the word of God. And why do I even bring that up? Because it was this book that we're studying together in 1 John that showed me that though I had said the right things and I believed all the facts, it wasn't until that surrender came that I was actually born again. John is writing this letter in part to help people diagnose if they have genuine saving faith. And now we're coming to the part of his letter that is quite frankly a little uncomfortable. 
And, and, and that is why I prayed before I even began to share tonight that God would protect the consciences of everybody because if you've got a sensitive conscience or if you feel like maybe you're not the Christian you should be or if you struggle at times with a sin, a pet sin or a besetting sin and you haven't maintained a, a perfect constant victory, you might be tempted tonight to say, well, I, I'm struggling in these areas and I'm not what I could be. Maybe I'm not saved. Well, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do his work today because I can't see anybody's heart. I didn't even know my own heart, and therefore I'm not qualified to judge anybody else's. But let's look at the word of God tonight because this is the test of our practical, righteous, practical righteousness. We've already looked at the test of doctrine. We've looked at the test of love, but this is our behavioral test. And what we're going to find out tonight, and it is very dogmatic, is that a person that is born again will live a transformed life and will not be dominated by sin. This is God's word, so let's carefully walk through it tonight. First of all, let's talk about our profession of faith being examined. Our profession of faith examined in verses three through six. Now, I don't have time to break all of these down, but look in verse number three, because we're going to find a word about sanctification there. The Bible says in verse number three, everyone who hopes in Jesus purifies him, excuse me, purifies himself even as Christ is pure. That is a really plain statement, and this is what it's teaching. That when it comes to this issue of becoming like Jesus, we have a responsibility in the process. We are not allowed to say, well, Lord, if you want me to be holy, make me holy. And then we go and live independently of God or live in rebellion or self-will. No, this is a comprehensive statement. Everyone who says they have a hope in Jesus Christ is accountable. How do I know that? Because the Bible says we purify ourselves. That means we obey, we surrender, we submit we are willingly following the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to find out later on in this book that the word says that God's commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome to us, but they're actually a blessing to us. And when we are indwelt by God, we want to be more like Jesus. Therefore, we engage in our own purity. In other words, um, we, we, I think so often we, we ask God to do things for us that God is actually saying, no, no, I'm actually telling you, you can do this. Uh, Lord, I don't want to scream at my spouse anymore. Please don't let me scream at my spouse anymore. You know what God says? Okay, I'm going to empower you. Stop screaming at your spouse. Uh, Lord, I, I don't want to give into this addiction anymore. I've got this addiction in my life, and I just don't want to do it. So, Lord, just take it away from me, and, and then you're called to actually cooperate. Uh, for me, it was something as simple as I, I asked God. I wanted to be delivered completely unto him. And I knew I had battled for decade with alcohol. And so when, when I was delivered, do you know what I needed to quit doing? I needed to quit going where? To the bars. I actually had to separate from some friends that were still engaging in illegal activity with, with marijuana and things like that. And so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say, God, I never, ever want to get stoned again, so make that not happen, and then go hang out with people who have, you know, a quarter pound of weed in their trunk or something. So is this a little too real for you tonight? Come on, just exhale. I'm talking to you. Maybe those aren't your issues. Maybe your issues are something different. You know, maybe, maybe you've got a food addiction. Well, stay away from Golden Corral. Uh, and so it could go on and on. The point I'm trying to make is this, is that we have a pro part to play in the process. We're accountable. And we do this on a continual basis. How do I know that? Because the Bible says we purify ourselves as Christ is pure. That means we are moving into Christ likeness. And I don't want to discourage anybody, but you haven't arrived to Christ likeness yet, nor have I. And so it's an ongoing process. So moving into verse number four, we get a word about sin. And this is going to be part of most of the theme of the rest of this uh, passage of scripture. Jo uh, John says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. And then he describes sin as being lawlessness. Now, there's so much more going to be said about sin here. I, I'm really going to leave that introductory comment to stand alone. Simply know this, that sin is in part a violation of God's law. It means we behave or act or think or live in a way that is beneath God's holy standard. But we need to go beyond that. We don't need to just think of it as we broke one of the rules. We need to realize that sin is also not only a violation of the law, but the author of that law. 
Um, the, if you think about it this way, if you, if you commit a crime in the state of Georgia, the state brings charges against you. Maybe your crime was against some individual, but the state of Georgia is the one who actually takes you and puts you on trial. Why? Well, you have violated somebody's personal right, but you've also violated the lawgiver. And so when we think about this, the Bible is describing here, John is telling us that all sin is in the spirit of lawlessness. Um, this is an intense passage, so I'm not going to have to raise my voice or be too demonstrative with it, but, but the, this is not going to pull any punches. You're not going to leave here flattered tonight at all, nor am I. Look in verse number five. Here's a word about the Savior because there is some good news in here. He says, speaking of Jesus, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And so before we despair, oh no, I'm a rebel, I'm a lawbreaker, I'm an individual who is, is, is at times given to violating this, this great God and his ethical code, I'm in trouble. Just remember, John's bringing the gospel in and out of this teaching. He says that Jesus came to take away sins. That the purpose of Jesus Christ was to come to people like you, to come to people like me. He's not perturbed. He's not frustrated. He's not resenting the fact that he has to, has to help you and rescue you and save you and clean you. That's why he came. And so we don't have to despair and we don't have to feel isolated. We don't need to wonder if he's going to abandon us or reject us. Why? Because his whole purpose was to come and work the work to take away sin. And the Bible is very clear here. Here's a statement of of his perfection and his holiness. Jesus had no sin of his own. You know, this coming Sunday, we're going to have a message about the crucifixion because we're approaching that time of year where we're celebrating the, the resurrection, but before there's an empty tomb, there's an occupied cross. And so we're going to look at Jesus on the cross. And do you know this, that if Jesus Christ had ever had one sinful thought, one sinful syllable in a word, one sinful action or attitude during the 33 and a half years he walked the earth as the son of man, if he had ever for one second slipped beneath God's holy standard of perfection, then his stretched out body on that cross would have been a supreme waste because he himself, perished the thought, would have been guilty of sin and therefore had been paying the price for his own sin when he died. But the Bible is very clear here. Hallelujah. Our King, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our sacrifice, our substitute was sinless and spotless. And therefore, he was the right one to substitute for our fouled life. You have a sinless sacrifice that has been uh, given on your behalf. That the price was perfectly paid and his name is Jesus. And then we get down and we see in verse number six, as we talk about our profession of faith being examined, here's a word about the saints. Now watch this. This is where it gets a little tight. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. If you carry a King James version, you, you probably need to listen a little harder because the verb tenses are brought out better in the ESV. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, that's pretty dogmatic. I get a little nervous when I read that. You know, I, I am absolutely assured of my salvation. But I'm going to tell you, when I read that, I, I, I get a little uncomfortable because it's so dogmatic. Now, had John not already told us in chapter 2, uh, whoever says that he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. I mean, we can't say that we don't ever sin. So John's obviously not saying if you ever commit a sin, you've never known Jesus or seen Jesus. But what he is saying is these verbs that we're going to be talking about in the Greek language, if you're new to Bible study, this text was originally written in Koine Greek. And so in the Greek, the verb tenses are important. And it's a present tense verb. Verb, and it's reflected properly here in the ESV, whoever practices sin, whoever continually sins, whoever sins and sins and sins and sins. And so what we're receiving here is John's conveying the picture of a life that is perpetually full of sin. And he makes a bold statement. He says, that individual is a person who has never seen Jesus and has never known him. Now, I want you to think with me, I've already given you my testimony. That was me. 
but I prayed the prayer, but I got baptized. I went to VBS, I went to Sunday school. Up until age 14, I was a pretty good kid, and I think I, I enjoyed praying, and I liked going to church and all of that, and so wasn't that real? Didn't that count for something? Well, Jesus made a statement about false teachers that we can also apply to everybody else, that you will know a tree by its what? By its fruit. That means you can, you can literally um, diagnose a life by what comes forth from that life. Now, I highly recommend you don't spend your time diagnosing other people. And I would highly recommend if you're going to turn the microscope anywhere, put it on your own heart. And so John has kind of sobered us up. And, and, and just notice in there, the phrase in the SV really helps us. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Now, I, I, I confess to you, let's see, we're on Wednesday. If I had 15 minutes or so, I bet I could make a list of probably at least 20 things that I'm conscious of that I did that would probably be biblically qualified as sin. Say, well, Jeff, what are you doing up there preaching to us? Get somebody who ain't sinning all over the place. Well, remember this. The Bible says whatsoever is of faith and not of faith is sin. The Bible says to know good and not to do it is sin. And, and sin is actually anything that in any way falls short of God's holy standard. And so while I'm confessing that I'm a sinner, you might want to just be honest and say you are too. Because there's probably things we should have done as under the Lord this week that we were either afraid to or negligent in, and the Bible says that that's sin. And so we can get nervous in here, but that's not what John is writing about. He's not talking about the occasional bad fruit. He's talking about the perpetual outflow of somebody's life. And so we're going to move further into this because as we examine our faith, now we're going to move into verses 7 and into the beginning of verse number 8, and let's look at our profession of faith questioned. Now, you say, Jeff, you shouldn't really call us to question our faith. Well, here you go. Paul did. I mean, look at the verse up on the screen, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Look at, look at this verse. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We're actually called by the Lord to examine our lives. We're actually not allowed to live an unexamined life. An unexamined life really isn't worth living. And so as believers, we want to know that our life is reflecting properly what comes out of our mouth. I mean, we've sung praise and we've prayed prayers and some gave offerings and, 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 and we are so easily able to quip and talk about spiritual things. But Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, says you really need to put yourself under the microscope of God's word. And so again... There's an opportunity here for us to get a little sobered on this. So verse number seven, back in 1 John, helps us to diagnose righteous behavior. Look, listen to what John says. I hope you keep your Bible open because we're staying in the text tonight. Little children, don't let anybody deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he, Jesus, is righteous. Now, this is really good. Because we've moved now away from the negative diagnostic and we're able to say, okay, is there anything righteous coming out of my life? Now, John is also not just giving a blanket statement saying anybody that does good works is going to heaven because he's halfway through his book already and he's been very clear about the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He's also you know, challenged us about our level of love, saying that it's impossible for us to walk in the light of the gospel if we don't have love in our heart to other people. And so you can't isolate this chapter away from everything else he said. So when we have the proper understanding about who Jesus is, when we're growing in our love for other believers, then we're able to say, and when righteous deeds are coming out of our life, all of that is evidence that is signifying that we actually are redeemed, that we're born again. So if we're going to test ourselves, it can't be about how I feel about my salvation on any given day. I'm actually given objective data to see what my life's about. And so it'd be a great time for all of us to ask the question, are we living for him in some way? It doesn't mean you're a missionary to Mozambique. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're, you're funneling tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars into the kingdom. It doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. You have to be some minister or singer. It, it, all of us. And my personal opinion, by the way, you don't have to agree with this. My personal opinion is we, lead, we need less 
um, vocational ministers, and we need more Christians that are in the marketplace and in jobs and working in the community. That's really where a lot of your righteous deeds are going to make a difference. And so John is telling us here, anybody who practices righteousness, um, you know, even good trees will occasionally produce a nasty looking piece of fruit. Oh, I, I'm a city guy. I grew up in the suburbs, uh, but my father-in-law has a, a little farm up in Dawsonville. And when the kids were smaller, we would go up there regularly and there's trees that have, there's, I think there's a pear tree. There's definitely apple trees out there. And we'd go out there and we'd pull one off, we'd eat them. But every now and then I'd see Landon reaching for one and it would just go in his hand. Now, you don't chop down the tree because of the occasional piece of bad fruit. That would be unwise. But if a tree produced no fruit or if a tree was constantly producing only rancid fruit, you would draw the conclusion there's something really wrong with this tree. It's not serving its purpose. Let's take it down. But when we make that application to our lives, look, you're you're occasionally going to produce something that is not real pleasant. You're going to bring forth some works in your life. You're going to think and do and say things that are unchristlike. And that is why we're told in this very book that when we sin and we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so don't panic. Nobody leaves here panicking today. If you've got some righteousness coming out of your life and it's intentional righteousness, and you're, you're seeking the Lord, and you're wanting to serve the Lord, and to the very best of your conscience, you are saying, God, my life is surrendered to you, and I want you to use me, and I, I want Jesus to be supreme in my life. Listen, that is evidence of a redeemed life. You may not be executing on all six cylinders all the time, but I want to encourage you that if your heart is Christward, that lost people really don't want to do that. It is something of the desire of the heart that is born of the Holy Spirit. And so we get down into the beginning of verse number eight, and here's the opposite side of the coin. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, listen to how politically incorrect this is. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. John, tell us how you really feel. Think about that in our culture today. You know how rare it is anymore for anything to be called a sin? You know how even more rare it is for somebody to take ownership of their sin? Because we we can blame it on our upbringing. We can blame it on a lack of love in the family. We can blame it on circumstances. We can blame it on on the government. We can blame it on pastoral leaders or, or Christians that let us down. There are so many places for us to cop out. But John just kind of strips everything away and he says, no, if you're living a life that is dominated or characterized by sin, listen to what he, he points his apostolic finger at us and says, you're of the devil. Preachers wouldn't be able to preach in our day if they talked like that. Maybe that's why we don't see revival like they saw in the first century. Maybe it has become that we're so interested in watering down and taking the edges off of God's truth that that there's not enough prick in us, enough jolt in us to, to awaken us to our sin. But John makes it very clear here. If your life is, again, present tense verb, that of continually practicing sin, John says, that's because you're still owned by the devil. Now, I don't have the ability to apply that to everybody's life in here. If nothing else, let me give you the the lowest common denominator that we should all walk out with tonight. Uh, The attitude of Scripture towards sin is very serious. I'm a big, big grace guy, but I have never believed in a grace that was given to make me feel good about my sin. Grace is there to relieve you when you're convicted. Grace is there to keep you alive when you have done something that is worthy of condemnation. But grace is not there to encourage us to sin. And if your idea of grace is that, oh, well, it doesn't really matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I'm living. It doesn't matter how I act because after all, there's grace. John says, well, if you're practicing unrighteousness with your life, you're of the devil. So I don't really know exactly what we do with that other than to strongly consider it. 
And I, I think it, it's probably worthy of us just taking a glance around the kingdom, or if you want to make it a little more practical, around those that we've interacted with in the kingdom. I mean, how many of us that have been in church for you know a handful of years or longer have seen people that, that sprouted up and had such promise and hope and were, seemed to be full of God? And, and, and they were like a shooting star that, that just burned out and crashed. I can't help it. Every time I go into this passage, I, I think of a couple of individuals that I, I once heard preach and I once, I, I once saw what I thought to be the anointing of God on them. And today, if you wanted to find them, you'd have to go to a back alley somewhere or a strip club or a bar because the, these guys have, have turned away. And you ask yourself, well, well, it's, I believe they're just backslidden. John didn't believe that. John did not believe that. Now, again, I don't feel like I'm qualified to judge, but my friends, when, when does it go from being backslidden for a little while to being proven that you have passed, have not passed the test? I, I think it'd be healthy for us from time to time to Tighten up our grip on the expectations that the gospel, the demands that are placed on us. Yes, it's freely given by God through Jesus Christ. It's completely paid for. But never let that ring in your ears as if you can live without accountability to this great and holy God. And so we moved into these last couple of verses. From our profession of faith being examined, from our profession of faith being questioned, to our profession of faith being validated. And this is where some relief comes, okay? Let's remember Jesus. Uh, Let's recall the purpose of God's Son, the reason the Son of God appeared. Here we have the second mention of why Jesus came. Watch this, was to destroy the works of the devil. When Dr. Douglas opened up the service with Uh, his encouragement and exhortation to us about spiritual warfare, I was saying, get him, Doc. That's right. Amen. Jesus came and he tore up the devil's domain. We don't see all things yet put under the feet of Christ, but we will. And Satan knows he has been emasculated. He has been dethroned. He has been deauthorized. And that literally the enemy knows he's a defeated foe. He had all his doubts removed three days after the crucifixion. On that first Easter Sunday morning when Satan had hurled his greatest weapon at the Son of God and thought he had him, and then word gets out in the demonic realm that the tomb is empty and the king of glory is exited, Satan said, what do we do now? We threw our best at him and he beat us. Hallelujah. And so we have it again right here that that, 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 that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And that includes temptations and sins and strongholds in our lives. That we have absolutely, there's there's no reason that we have to live a life of defeat. I'm going to tell you on the authority of the word of God, whatever it is in your life that intimidates you, some stronghold, maybe an addiction, maybe a a besetting sin that's been with you for years or decades, I want to tell you, you don't have to make up your mind that that's just the way it is, that God will take you and he will absolutely refashion you and fill you and transform you. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. And the biblical positional truth is that all things have become new. Old things are passing away. Um, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. Not all of you have immoral behavior in your life, but I would bet the farm. Is betting a sin? I don't know, but I would bet the farm that everybody in here has a, a problem with the occasional or maybe not so occasional bad attitude. That there's something, you can be cruising along and you're, you're singing, you know, amazing grace and you're handing out gospel tracts and, you know, you're laying hands on the sick and you're praying in the spirit and you're, you're just full. And then all of a sudden, this one little thing that trips you up every time comes across your path and, and you're just, <laughs> right? bunch of self-righteous Wednesday nighters. Come on. (laughs) All of us have that weak thing where it seems like 10 times out of 10, it gets us. Maybe it's an individual in your life. Maybe it's a certain circumstance. Maybe it's a stronghold of the heart. And maybe you've bought into the lie that that's just going to be with you until the day you die. I I just want to tell you, Your king came to destroy the works of the devil, and he can also destroy the works in your flesh. 
And so when we're talking about this, I, I just want to tell you on the authority of God's word, this is really so strong in my heart in these days because I, 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 I don't know what God's doing all in my life, but I do know one thing that I am absolutely increasingly growing more convinced that there is victory and a practical walking in the spirit that is so available to us that we've actually been religiously educated into not believing in. That we've actually been taught, well, you're going to sin, and you're just going to have to deal with it, and you're going to sin. And we've actually been educated more into defeatism than into victory. And I just want to tell you, the Bible says that there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape so that you can bear it. I think that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's somewhere in there. But, but the point being is this, is there's nothing that has authority over you. Why? Because Jesus Christ lives in you and he has destroyed all that opposes him. And that includes everything in your life and mine. So wake up tomorrow morning and whatever it is that nags you in the morning or nags you at lunch or intimidates you as you go to bed, speak out against it in the name of Jesus and just go ahead and tell the devil on occasion, my savior lives in me, the one who is living in me is greater than you and he came to destroy your works, devil. Amen? All right. Woo. Sometimes I need a third arm to high five myself, amen? That's the purpose of Jesus Christ. How many of you think that he accomplishes what he sets his purpose to? It says he came to destroy the works of the devil. It says back up there in verse number five that he uh, appeared to take away sins. That kind of leaves me without an excuse. I don't know why I shouldn't be living in absolute victory. And so I think I will. I think I can make up my mind that I just believe I'm going to do that. And I'm going to have to make it up again tomorrow. And I'm going to have to make it up again the next day. But as we think, so our life will be. So we get down to verse number nine. We're going to not only recall the purpose of the son, but recognize the power of the spirit. Watch this. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. We've already covered that. Why though? How is it that we're able not to live that way? What makes the difference? Right there. For God's seed abides in him. God's seed abides in the person that is born of God. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so this is so encouraging. It's not just a matter of you trying to do better. It's not just an issue of you, you know, well, I'm going to turn it up a notch. Listen, you are actually inhabited by God. You are not divine. You are not yet fully glorified, but you have the nature of God, the seed of the life of God working in you. And so you have God's life fighting against the devil and sin's death that works in your flesh. And so the Bible says here that, again, we've already mentioned it, greater is the one that lives in you than the one that is in the world. And therefore, the seed of God in you actually affects your righteousness. Do you cooperate? We've already established that. Do you, do you need to submit and surrender and yield and obey and be filled and walk in that? You must, absolutely. And that's the process of sanctification. But the glory of it is this. Listen, oh. I could shout or fly or do something tonight. Good night. I tried for a decade to quit drinking. I tried, man. I went to, I went to a, a Kennestone Hospital to detox because of some, some serious drug issues. And as soon as I got out, what happened? I went right back to the same old junk. Why? No seed of life, only the root of death. And so every day that I could for 10 years, I was ingesting substances and trying to please my flesh in any way I could. I was dominated, I believe demonized in that decade. And then August 4th, 1994, in just a pitiful display of messiness, I just said, I'm done, help me. You can kill me or you can save me is what I told God. I said, I don't care, but I'm done running from you. And I got up off the floor and I crawled into bed and I woke up and I knew something was different. Literally, I felt like the sky looked different. The walls looked different. And from that day on, I promise you, 
never got drunk again, never did another drug. What happened? Did Jeff just finally get amped up? No, it had nothing to do with me. I couldn't quit any of that stuff. What happened is I now had a new nature. I was a new person. It wasn't God tweaking and improving me. It was God crucifying me, burying me, and raising me. I'm preaching out of my headset tonight. Good, not a lot. And so that's what I'm telling you, friend. You, if you're saved, you actually have that in you. There may be a thousand forces lying about who you are, but I'm going to tell you that doesn't take away from the fact that the seed of God is in you, and so you will not continue to live in unbridled sin. And then verse 10, and I'm just going to have to quit. I really don't want to. I'm having fun. Revealing the paternity of the Father. I called this message spiritual DNA test. Why? Uh, Unfortunately, we live in a culture where we're not always sure who the daddy is of a child in the womb. And so what do they do when the child is born? They do a DNA test. And what do they want to find out? Who's your daddy? They want to find out who's, who's this baby's father. And that's what John's doing here. He, he's, he's looking at us and trying to figure out, uh, who's, who's your daddy? Let's do some tests. Because Jesus once looked at a group of religious hypocrites and said, you're of your father, the devil. And John must have heard that that day because he got to write it down here. He's like, if you keep living like that, you're of the devil. But here, look at the good news. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. You got two groups. Everybody you know is in one of these two groups. Everybody you know, no middle ground. Children of the Most High God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, are the children of darkness, the children of Satan. Everybody we know. This makes it evident. What is it? Watch this. John says, here is the DNA test. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Let's just let the Bible speak. Those, no matter what they say, No matter where they go to church, no matter what ministry they're involved in, no matter how much they're adored and applauded and gifted, if their life is unrighteous, unrighteous, if that is the normal outflow of their life, and by the way, you are who you are in private, not in public, because everybody's behaving in here, right? (laughs) We got cameras rolling. Everybody's on their best behavior. Who we really are is who we are in private. And so... Whoever doesn't practice righteousness, John just says that person's not of God. And then he adds this, and we're going to expand on this in a couple of messages. Nor is the one who doesn't love his brother. And so he brings us back to the love test, which we don't have time to go into tonight. Let me just give you this old ancient proverb from Solomon. Proverbs 20, verse 11. It'll be up on the screen. Even a child makes himself known by his acts by whether his conduct is pure and upright. Do you know how many times you've done this in your life? You're watching the playground, you're sitting there, maybe you're at the park, and you see all these five to nine-year-olds running around. Let's say there's 20 of them out there. You're out there 20 minutes, and you know what you've done in a matter of 20 minutes? You said, those are the good kids, but you better watch out for this one over here. You know what you've done? You've watched that child's behavior, and you've formulated a decision, you've said it's pretty clear this kid has issues or these kids have issues, and, and w- w- we can do that. We can look at little children and we can say, okay, we got something good going on here, but this one over here, well, they need some help. And Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked the earth as far as we know other than Jesus Christ, said, yeah, w- w- even, you can even tell a child by how they behave. And you know what John's doing here? He's just unpacking that proverb. And he's taking kind of the silly complication out of it. Um, I'm a middle-aged guy. I wish maybe I could go back in time and just live one year in my grandfather's generation or my great-grandfather's. You know why? Because they didn't play around. They weren't politically correct. They, they, didn't, they weren't overly concerned with whether people got their feelings hurt or not. They just tell it plain and tell it like it is, and they weren't worried about, you know, somebody, you know, getting their feelings hurt and, you know, squirting a few tears and stuff. They, they, they just said, here's the truth. And I do believe as we approach the end of the age that one of the things that God the Spirit is going to do in the church 
because I, my personal belief, I hadn't said this in weeks, I've been really good about not you know, forecasting Armageddon or anything, but I, I absolutely sense it. The more I pray and the more I tarry in the presence of the Lord, I sense that the church, this generation, is going to go through some apocalyptic, apoc- <clears throat> apocalyptic stuff that we always assumed we were going to get a free pass on. I believe we're going to experience some intense persecution right here in the United States of America before the second coming. And I believe that what's going to happen is there's going to be an earnest call upon the people of God that God the Spirit is going to be moving in all of our lives, not just pulpits, in our lives as Christians, and we are going to become more and more focused and grounded and centered in biblical truth, and the fluff is going to get burned away. Because I'm going to tell you, when persecution hits, Sunday-only Christians, cultural Christians, make it convenient for me Christians, they're not going to pass the test. You say, Jeff, what test? What did Jesus say? He or she that endures unto the end shall be saved. You know what that tells me? You just read... Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you got a lot of pretense at the end of the age. You read Matthew chapter 7, you got a lot of pretense at the end of the age. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, you got a lot of people that are playing around at the end of the age. And Jesus gives a warning in Revelation. We see it in Matthew 24 and 25 played out. We see it in Matthew 7, and where the broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few that be that find it. You got a lot of people that were playing games. But they weren't righteous. And so when the trouble hits, it's nothing for them to walk away and say, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not with them. I'm, I'm not with the Christians. Because the righteous are going to endure. And the righteous are going to receive their reward. <laughs> 